The small black goat looked out into the immense auditorium and sighed. The cavernous space was devoid of an audience. Each of the six hundred upholstered maroon seats stared back at him with taunting flat faces. Jackson Jesse Simpson, screeched the teacher, literally. She was a puffy, square-shaped screech owl with chestnut tufts for ears and round golden eyes the size of saucers behind her wire-framed glasses. Jackson jumped and glowered at her. His scruffy eyebrows pulled into hoods over his eyes. The three kittens playing angels giggled. Maisie, the calf, rolled her eyes at Raleigh, the donkey. He braid soft laughter in return. Mrs. Polymer tapped her cane on the polished oak stage. Tonk, tonk, tonk. The sound echoed out into the cold, dark theater. She said, please pay attention. Why? He asked sulkily, his voice small, from the back row of animals. He added, I don't even have any lines. His head hung low, the ends of his red woolen scarf dusted the floor. This is a group effort, young goat. It is tradition that all the class play a part. Why can't I be a wise man? Jackson implored, lifting his dark eyes to the opossum, raccoon and badger cast in those parts. Jerry the possum stuck his tongue out at the little black goat who then added, I'm wiser than they are. Now the entire class guffawed. Hush now. Quiet down. Screeched the screech owl. Time for one more rehearsal. In your places, please. Jackson's ears echoed with the sound of paws and hooves trotting and tapping and clotting on the wooden stage as he crept behind the backdrop scenery and heavy curtain beyond. If anyone noticed his absence, they remained in relieved silence of it. Jackson stepped out one of the double backstage doors and into an icy gray world, swirling with white. It was as if he'd stepped into a snow globe. He picked up his pace, his scarf a whipping flag before him, and bounded into the safety of the cedar trees bunched at the far end of the school property. He shivered icy flakes from his coat and leapt deeper into the woods. The small black goat didn't want to go home to the orphanage. He felt alone amongst his peers and today had never felt so unloved, so useless, so small. After an hour he realized that not only had he never ventured this far into the dark, shadowy forest but he was entering the forbidden acres. The wind whipped bare branches into his face. He squinted to protect his eyes. Snowy gales played hide and seek with him from between the immense pines. They always found him, stabbing at his soft belly with icicle fingers. You're it. He rounded a bend and a flurry of immense black birds flop, flop, flopped into the charcoal gray sky. The whole world was a broke black and white movie of harsh contrasts and menacing premonitions. Ravens, he thought suddenly nervous. The worst thing about ravens is that where they lurk, death does too. The birds flew to the treetops high above him and screeched curses at him in an ancient language he did not understand. He lay on his belly on the frozen white earth and covered his head with his hooves, expecting to feel razor-sharp talons slicing into his for any second. A blue jay swooped suddenly from a patch of inky black cedar shadows its feathers a welcome splash of brilliant azure in the monochromatic clearing. It caught as it circled above him. As he watched, bolts of brilliant yellow lightning flew from the bird's head, aimed towards the ravens in the trees. All but one raven flew into the sky, like graceful, distinguished Draculus. The jay flew into the tree opposite the remaining raven. A tiny figure popped up from around the far side of its neck, it looked like charred kindling pulled from a hearth bound together by wire and wrapped in black rags. A tiny, pointed hat sported tiny, pointed ears. As Jackson watched in wonder and horror, the evil creature's eyes flashed blue sparks and a nearly white fireball, tinged in blue, flew from its outstretched twiggy hands. It nailed the jay bird's wing. The jay tumbled head over heels to the ground. A splash of blue feathers drifted in its wake. Before hitting the ground, a tiny figure leapt from the bird's back. The wee elf tucked into a ball and rolled somersaults atop the snowy ground. It came to a stop in front of Jackson's nose, spraying the goat's astonished face with fine, icy flakes. The enchanting elf bounced to her feet and looked around for her bird. In forest green tights and pointy brown booties, 
She was a blur of green as she raced to her feathered companion. She skidded to a halt at its chest. Her pretty, pale face all but disappeared in soft blue feathers as she listened for a heartbeat. Jackson said quietly, Is he dead? The wee she elf spun towards the voice as if she'd forgotten he was there. He was used to that. She said, No, her heart beats. The goat and elf looked up into the treetops. The evil black duo was gone. Jackson fired off questions. What was that? You're an elf, aren't you? Where are we? The pretty little elf put her mittened hands on her hips. She wore a silky, long-sleeved tunic, emerald green, with bronze-colored embroidery, a yellow scarf and belt. Ash blonde hair spiked out from her acorn helmet. She umfied and removed the nutshell from her head. Her hair spilled in messy corn silk waves down her back to her knees. As she neared the young goat, he saw that her enormous eyes were chocolate brown with gold and amber flecks. She looked like one of those old 1970s paintings of waifs with ginormous eyes. She said, Yes, I'm an elf, duh. That was a Nordic Balfi, a Norda for short. She added cryptically, We are not far from my home, though I fear I have no way to get there. I won't leave Blueberry Twinkletoes. She looked sadly at the J. Tears magnified her mysterious dark eyes. One escaped. It slid down her rosy cheeks and dropped from her pointy chin. When it hit the snow, a tiny spray of golden glitter poofed. A flurry of fluttering wingbeats filled the clearing. A flurry of snowflakes drifted to the ground. Cardinals, goldfinches, chickadees, robins, and more allied on low-lying branches, each carrying a wee elf dressed in similar outfits, tunics and tights, scarves and mittens, in a plethora of mainly green shades. The elf next to Jackson said, This is my family. I'm Astra Seneca by the way. I'm Jackson. I can help you get home. It'll be dangerous. The Nordif are out in full force. We are losing the battle against them. I fear we may lose not only our home, but our entire race. I have no family. I have nothing to lose. Let me help you. Astra looked into Jackson's sad, nearly black eyes for a few seconds then nodded. What a shame. You have such a good heart, young goat. She called to her clan who waited silently in the trees. This is Jackson Jesse Simpson. Jackson goggled at her. She continued. Point he is going to help me home. The elves in the trees, mounted on songbirds, chattered amongst themselves. At last, the oldest, with snow-white hair and a knee-length double-braided beard, called down. Very well, daughter. We will escort you from above, lest the demon Nordufs return. One by one, each bird-mounted elf dropped long, colorful filaments to the ground. Orange, yellow, red and purple silk-like threads floated down gracefully. Astra gathered them up quickly and tied them all together in one ten-foot-long cord. She whispered into Barry's ear. The bird's head lifted warily. She rose shakily to her feet and cried out as her broken wing dropped to the ground. One of the goldfinches came down and silently landed by the jay like a fluffy, lemony yellow pom-pom with legs and small, pointy beak. A thin elf with honey-colored hair, wearing moss-green tunic and tights, leapt like a ballet dancer from the pretty bird's back. Astra and the male elf, Brannon, secured the poor blue jay's wing to her side. Then, with Astra on one side of Jackson and Brannon on the other, they lifted the blue jay onto Jackson's shoulders and secured the bird with the remainder of the silken cord. Brannon gave a little salute to the loaded-up goat and leapt upon his finch's back. Our miles into the woods, the sky grew dark. Astra lifted her tiny mittened hands to the sky. The clouds parted, revealing the brilliant white orb of a moon. Astra's hands filled with moonlight. The magical lantern was small but bright. High above them, two dozen more tiny lanterns glowed, and the sky was filled with flying stars. The trees were getting sparser, and the icy, frozen ground inclined upwards at sharper and sharper an angle. Astra told the sure-footed goat stories of their enemy, the Nordaf, as they ascended the mountain. They were an ancient race of elves from the deepest bowels of Norway hills displaced by ore-mining humans. They sought to take over Astra's race of kindwinets. 
Their leader, Drigan, sought ultimate power through the death of Astra, the most powerful magic elf their world had ever seen. He intended to enslave them and use their magic for his own elevation to a godlike status. He would drain them of their powers, their life force, then toss the husks away like garbage. And he dreamed of taking revenge up the human race. We live at the top of this mountain, inside it. When the Nordufs discover this, we will be doomed. Just then, the entire mountain quaked. The earth under Jackson's small hooves reverberated with thunder. His feet did a scary little skittering dance. His back legs slipped over the steep edge, but only for a few seconds. After the shock wore off, he found his feet and continued up the steep slope with fierce determination. The elves in the air chattered excitedly, in alarm. Suddenly, the air around Jackson and Astra was filled with huge, flapping black flags. The ravens swooped and swirled, cutting Astra and Jackson off from the rest of their clan. Over Jackson's head, Astra fired a white-hot fireball from her palms. She nailed a raven's wing and it screamed in fury as it fell, a thousand feet below. Two more ravens fell past them, Haven taken shots from overhead. Then a soft, grayish-brown wren fell past, fluttering a single wing uselessly. Astra pulled the bird and rider in on a strand of silken rope like a fisherman reeling in a trout. They clung to the cords around Jackson's shoulders. A raven, the largest by nearly twice the size of the others, circled Jackson's group. Astra yelled, Drickin! Faster! Faster, Jackson! Drickin sent a whitish-blue bolt of lightning at a cardinal that swooped down close. She yelled, No! and shot a yellow-tailed bolt that intercepted the blue one. They burst together in a retina-scorching display of fireworks. As soon as Astra had let go of the last bolt, Drickin had one aimed at her. She was too late to deflect it. It knocked her flat against Jackson's neck. He felt hot, burning, embers and smelled singed fur. He called out. Astra. He got no answer from her. The elf they had rescued sobbed and said into Jackson's left ear. She's dead. A flurry of fireballs erupted angrily over their heads and three more ravens fell head over heels past them black feathers swirled in the gale winds. Their strapped-on stick-figure demon riders either flopped limply, like knobby bags of bones, or they flayed futilely to get free. The elves disappeared over the tip-top of the mountain. Jackson struggled to follow them to their world. The snow was a storm at the apex. It all but blinded the relentless goat. There, cried the elf on his back. Jackson forced himself still. His legs trembled with the urgency to keep going down the other side. He strained to see what the elf was pointing to. There, a spark of light, a small crevice. Jackson wondered if he'd fit. As if reading his mind, the elf yelled over the shrieking wind. It's wider than it looks. The entire length is covered by ice and snow. Jackson nodded and with renewed strength made his way quickly down the steep slope, sliding and scrabbling for footholds the whole way. The giant raven screeched in his right ear. He jumped, losing his footing for a few seconds. Hold on, hold on, screamed the elf from his neck. Almost there, Jackson was close enough to see half a dozen tiny green-clad arms waving them on like grass stalks bristling in the wind. The raven swooped and hovered directly in front of Jackson's face, blocking his advance. Then Pyasasasasaf shoop, a bluey-white fireball, sizzling with electricity, came straight at him. It flashed between his eyes and hurt like nothing he'd felt before. He was blind. He made his feet move, but they galloped in nothing but thin air. The raven screeched in pain and anger. Its harsh voice disappeared downwards. He heard the feathers rustling, heading down. The elf on his back said, Astra spelled you. After you were hit, the fireball rebounded at the bird. Double strength. Woohoo. He slammed into a snowy ledge and tried scabbling onto it. He managed to stand into a crouch but, still being blind and discombobulated, took a step in the wrong direction. He felt himself tumbling down into blood freezing, empty space. The weeping screamed so high-pitchedly in his ear. It was nearly soundless, like a dog whistle. In silent blackness his consciousness left him. Gradually, 
The edges of his vision brightened to gray, then came on full force. He looked down and saw white and green and patches of brown streaking past far below. His small, shiny black hooves were galloping in thin air. The ground at least 1,200 feet below. I'm dead and dreaming. He thought, a wonderful bestest dream ever. He looked up and screamed. He'd nearly flown right into the mountain that he recognized as the home of the elves. The elf on his back joined his scream and pulled up on the cords as if they were reins. The jay caught and the wren squeaked a cry. Jackson flew vertically up another 400 feet to the mountain top, as if pulled up like a kite on the wind. The sky was clearing. The top was level with the few remaining wispy clouds. They breezed away into the starry black night. The crevice was easy to spot. A lantern was burning warm, welcoming sunny light. As Jackson and his riders approached the entrance to elf sentries in green and gold waved frantically and laughed and cheered. As Jackson landed at the cavern mouth, two dozen more elves had appeared. They quickly untied the birds and Astra's lifeless body and whisked them away inside. Jackson squeezed through the narrow opening and followed the elves down deep into the bowels of the mountain. It was warm and cozy, with high, vaulted ceilings of natural granite. Hundreds of tiny moonlight lanterns lit up the vast space. The walls and ceiling sparkled magically with mica that caught the lantern light. An old elf woman, the elder's wife, brought the worn-out goat a warm drink of herbs and cinnamon. In minutes he was asleep. The next morning, he awoke in a large, toasty warm room with rows of beds like a hospital. He was amused to see the elves had put four of their largest beds together for him. Yet his hooves still hung over the end. Next to him was the jaybird, her wing bandaged against her body. He turned over and saw Astra fast asleep in the next bed. She was breathing and alive, though bandages covered her arms, and her face was reddened as if sunburnt. Brandon sat at her side and held her hand. He turned around to Jackson and said, She'll be fine in a week or so. Thank goodness. So, it wasn't a dream then? I really flew? My heavens yes. No. I mean yes, you can fly. And no, you weren't dreaming. He laughed in delight at the goat's wondering, elated expression. He said, Astra spelled you so you could save us all. But I fell. I nearly killed us all. Without you, Astra would be no longer and the Nordufs would either enslave us or slaughter us. She is still only a child, our savior. Her powers will grow as she matures. Like the baby Jesus, Jackson said under his breath. Louder, he said. I've got to go. I'm needed at home. The elder elves and a few of the others had joined Brannon. The eldest with the long white beard said. Yes, you must go now. The flying spell won't last much longer, though long enough to see you home. On the stage of the school auditorium, Jackson Jesse Simpson looked out at the audience. Every seat was filled, and every face glowed with Christmas cheer. He proudly stood in the back row of animals, in between a white pygmy goat smaller than he, and a pretty little chestnut filly, excitedly hopping from hoof to hoof. He looked at the three wise men. The opossum in the center looked up and winked at him, smiling. As the entire cast sang Silent Night together, Jackson's voice joined in. He felt in perfect harmony for the first time ever. He saw at the very back of the theater, in the ebony darkness, two hundred tiny yellowy white sparks, wavering to and fro along with the song that filled the air. Welcome to Typecast. Welcome to It's in my birthday, yeah, cause I gotta say You're looking like a gift for me Wrapped up nice and neat, baby Get in my way now, don't be shy We'll be here dancing day and night Get in my groove now, don't be shy Cause I got this list of my favorite things You could be the part where it all begins You could be the first and the second and the third And the rest of it Baby
baby, I will show you how you can catch my vibe And right away I so much time looping in the blurry lights Get in my way now, don't be shy We'll be here dancing day and night Get in my groove now, don't be shy Cause I got the system, my favorite things You could be the part where it all begins You could be the first and the second and the third and the rest of
easy to speak out about the way I live But it's a 24 karat dream No supermodel in my dirty jeans But in my 24 inches heels I am not pretending I'm born like this a game for the reckless It's so extreme and I don't really care Calling me a mad woman, mad woman No, I don't really care, I don't really care, yeah Cause boy, it's none of your business If I'm a mad woman If I'm a man, I'm a man. 